Hello and welcome to this week's 7 Days of Science. Coming up in the news this week, I talk about some news. News. Ben talks about some news. news. And I talk about some news. News. <laughs> Starting off the news this week, some breaking awesome astronomical news has come with a paper published today that details the Hubble telescope's observation of the most distant star ever observed. This has been made possible thanks to a gravitational lens, which is essentially a nearby cluster of galaxies magnifying what the Hubble telescope can see. The star, nicknamed Irandel, is a colossal 12.8 billion light years away, making it the farthest star yet observed by 3.4 billion light years. As we are measuring distance in light years here, this is of course directly comparable to its age as we are observing it, meaning that we are observing the star as it was 2.8 billion years ago. That's only around a billion years younger than the universe itself. Because of just how distant this star is, scientists are waiting for the much more modern James Webb Space Telescope, launched in December last year, to take a look at it. Hopefully this fantastic discovery can be confirmed then, and we'll know then that Irandel is indeed this single star from the dawn of the universe. Well, a billion years after. In other news, the non-profit environmental organisation Ember has released its 2022 Global Electricity Review. As always, source links will be in the description and I recommend you giving this one a read. Not only does it cover some important ground, the report page is lovely and intuitive, so that's always a bonus. They found that wind and solar power has increased to make up just over 10% of the world's energy generation, but coal use has also risen in 2021. Gas and unfortunately hydro and nuclear power electricity production has fallen in 2021, with the total share of clean power generation in 2021 being 38%. Despite this, there has also been a 7% rise in CO2 emissions from global power production, probably in part influenced by the 5% rise in demand for electricity. And now over to Ben, who doesn't have any news about the sauropod dinosaur Amargosaurus. Thanks Doug. Up next in the news for this week is a very interesting study that has re-examined the bizarre hyper-elongated spines on the necks of the sauropod dinosaur Amargosaurus and its relatives. This paper explains how, in the past, a few different interpretations for the life appearance of these spines had been suggested, including as supporting a crest or sail structure, a bison-like hump, or as being the bony cores of horns projecting from the vertebrae. Well, this new research has investigated the morphology of these spines in detail, taking thin sections and examining the internal microstructure of the bone of the spines in Amargosaurus itself. What they found was that there was actually no evidence for a keratinized sheath being present over the bony cores. Instead, the presence of a system of ligaments potentially connecting the spines to one another was detected. So, it seems, reconstructions of Amargosaurus with a double sail-like structure along its neck are actually probably the correct ones after all. Additionally, the researchers suggest that this sail structure would likely have been present in related sauropods too, such as the recently named Bahadosaurus and Pilmatuia, which also possessed elongate neck spines. Also in the paleontology news is the very cool discovery of the first titanosaur nesting site in Brazil. This is now the northernmost occurrence of a titanosaur sauropod nest site in South America, and preserves remains of several egg clutches as well as partial isolated eggs and many shell fragments. Sadly, there haven't been any embryos found so far, but the anatomy of the eggs themselves confirm that they are indeed from titanosaurs. The structures of the clutches also add to the evidence for the suggestion that these dinosaurs were burrow nesters, excavating depressions in the soil to lay their eggs in. So, another very nice sauropod discovery for this week. And finally, there's been a fascinating new study looking into the rise and diversification of the mosasaurs. These marine lizards appeared towards the very end of the Mesozoic era, in the last 30 million years of the Cretaceous, and the exact cause for their increase in diversity at this time has been a major question in the study of these animals. In this new research, paleontologists investigated how their feeding strategies and methods of locomotion diversified by taking certain measurements from the forelimbs and mandibles, discovering that the highest levels of Mosasauroid disparity were actually in the latest Cretaceous meaning these reptiles didn't have an early burst of feeding or locomotory disparity, but instead diversified to a greater extent later on in their evolution, a very different case to what happened in other lineages of marine reptiles. The research also finds that biological driving factors had more of a significant impact than physical ones, and were the primary forces behind Mosasauroid diversification. 
So, lots of interesting implications for the structure of Lake Cretaceous oceans there. Back to Doug in the studio. Thank you, Ben. Well, that's it for this week's 7 Days of Science. I do hope you enjoyed, and we'll see you on